is predicated on policies in order to checkmate rebellion. Why do we have why must we have a structure in a local church? Because there are about five categories of people that will be in your church. One, the wicked people. Two, the careless. Three, the zealous. Four, the faithful. Can I repeat that? The group of people that will be in a local church, the wicked people will be in your church. Whether you are spiritual or not, there will be wicked people. There will be a man who maltreat the husband. There will be a husband that maltreat the wife. The wicked people will be there. Two, careless people. Those who don't care about their lives. Those who don't care about their health. Those who don't care about their marriage. Those who don't care about their finances. There will be careless people in the church. Then number three, we are going to have zealous. Those who will be full of zeal, but there is no structure around them. And then number four, you are going to have what I call the faithful. Now because church is going to have various people, there must be a policy and a structure that eventually accommodate and various people and then be able to streamline one of the things is that when somebody joins a local church he must go through the policy of that church he must go through the structure of that church to be able to help him become all what god asks him to become hallelujah and this is very 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 important this is very very important somebody say a louder amen, amen. all right also, I want to talk on this church structure. We must also know that it is impossible to run a church without a vision. Somebody say a vision. It's not possible. It's not possible to run a church without a vision and then a program. The first thing you do as a pastor or as a member is that you must be a man of vision. Vision is what is God showing you. Do we understand? What is God worth showing me? After what God is showing you, you will do program that correspond the vision. That is how to preserve your ministry. If you have a genuine anointing, you must not invest it in wrong assignments. What actually kills ministers is that the anointing is genuine, but the assignment is wrong. And if you invest anointing into wrong assignment, you will not just only be attacked, you will become vulnerable. Very important, you must know how to connect um, this together. And uh, I pray God's spirit will help us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now that we, we'll, um, let's look at scripture one more time. When the Bible says Paul planted Apollo water and God gives what? Increase. Someone say Paul planted apollo waters what does god give god gives increase the increase is what god gives god doesn't plant god does not water now i want you to repeat after me the increase is what god gives god does not plant neither does he water what that means is that it is the responsibility of a man that is all what your call is all about either to plant or somebody to water but the moment the process of watering and plantings are complete what are we going to have we're going to have increase imagine you plant and somebody doesn't water there won't be increase imagine you want to water and there is no seed in the soil there won't be increase so we must understand this truth today that god actually wants your church to grow now there is no church that is neither local nor global it all depends on the vision what does it depend upon vision. say it one more time vision. what is vision seen from god's perspective seeing things from god's wealth perspective that's the one of the way to break it down can we say it one more time say vision, vision. seeing things from god's perspective now say after me one more time the perspective of god towards what i do is what i call vision and this vision is two ways somebody say prophetic vision and creative vision 
in Proverbs chapter 29, the Bible says, where there is no vision, people will perish. That kind of vision is prophetic. He said unto Jeremiah, what seest thou? And he said, I saw the rod of an almond tree. He said, thou hast seen well. For from henceforth, I will esteem my word to perform. So the first vision you see about your ministry is a supernatural vision. That vision is not, nobody's going to be responsible for it. It will be the evidence of your call and it will be your response to the demands of the spirit. So every vision begins as prophetic vision, but it ends as constructive vision. It begins as what? My goodness. It begins as what? Prophetic. It ends as what? Constructive. What does it mean a prophetic vision? That is the vision you have that help, helps you to answer to the call of God. God showed you thousands of people in your dream, in your vision. You saw yourself preaching to millions of people. That is where the ministry begins from. But ministry does not end with prophetic vision. It ends with constructive vision. So let's, what is the difference between the prophetic vision and constructive? With your spirit, you receive prophetic vision with your mind you receive constructive vision that means in the place of prayer and fasting god will drop some things into your spirit amen and after that thing is being dropped into your spirit you will now through the wisdom of god through the helps of the sound mind you will now begin to construct that which has been received from the lord do we understand that i will give you an example of that so the best thing God will do for you is to give you a prophetic vision. A prophetic vision is a vision that happens without your efforts. It's a vision that drops into your mind. But if you, it will go from the prophetic into constructive, it will go through effort and labor. A lot of people don't, think, don't know that Paul planted an Apollo water is human effort. God gave increase is God's power. Hallelujah. So you are going to labor in the place of prayer and the word of God. And after you have labored in the place of prayer and the word of God, God will drop something into your spirit. But you see, if the wisdom is absent in your, in your mind, how to get the vision done becomes a serious issue a lot of people will face. Now, there are two basic ways through which we grow our church. Two basic ways. If you are starting something from five people to ten people to fifteen people. There are two basic ways in which any things of the kingdom can expand. You know, you must understand that church is the embassy of God on the earth. Church has five faces, according to Bible. The first aspect of church is that church is the embassy of God on the earth. So anything of the kingdom will grow in two ways. One church grows through the demonstration of god's power how does church grows please talk to me acts of the apostle chapter two three four five between Acts chapter one two three four five church have spent 20 years church grows primarily through the demonstration of the power of god you shall receive power after the holy ghost has come but the second one, church becomes stable through the wisdom of God. Church becomes stable through the wisdom of God. So we have what we call stable growth. Somebody say stable growth. We are experiencing stability at the same time we are growing. We are not growing and we are experiencing chaos. We experience stability and then we experience growth. Now this is a very important, why am I saying it this way? Is that I have defined the church structure. Am I right? Hallelujah. The arrangement of wealth. Can somebody remind us? I like to, that's the way I do my teaching. What is the church structure? The arrangement of an organization in what? In a definite pattern. And what are we arranging? We are arranging the vision. We are arranging the policy. And we are arranging the processes. It therefore means that everybody that comes into your church have different experiences. And I say principally there are four people that come to church. Careless, zealous, 
wicked and what? And faithful. So what is going to be a structure that will be established to accommodate all these kind of people without putting problem in the church? And that's why a lot of people don't understand that the church is the embassy of God on the earth. People are coming from where they are molested, where they are hurt. There must be a structure that must be established to help them. All right. Praise the Lord. Okay, so now church grows through the demonstration of God's power. Act chapter 2, 3, 4, 5. We saw that by Acts of the Apostle chapter 6, the Bible said there arose a problem in the church. Therefore, there was a need for a structure to cater for that. So the church has two things, has an altar and a table. The altar is the place where you preach. The table is the place of administration. They said, we will give ourselves to the ministry of the word of God and prayer. But you appoint your, over yourself deacons. So the appointment of the deacon is not an altar work. It's an administration. And then we will not leave the altar of prayer and, uh, and then with the ministry of the word. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So church becomes stable through the wisdom of God. This is called stable growth. The wisdom of God in a local church finds expression. Leadership. leadership. Somebody say leadership. leadership. Uh, people don't understand when we say leadership. People just think gifted people. No. Gifted people are not leaders. Gifted people are not leaders. They can be leaders, but they are not leaders. They can become leaders, but they are not leaders. I have a pastor in my church. He can preach as I preach. And he's been with me very faithful, consistent. And he has a strong uh, leadership strong leadership power over the church and still it does it can't preach the way i preach so most of the things we are looking for they are the people who can preach but you must look for somebody who is a strong leader and uh, so second one is project somebody say project whether we like it or not our local church our vision will be tested 
by the strength of our leadership and then the project policy project vision and number four programs coordination of programs coordination of program if you have a genuine anointing and you invest this in a wrong assignment you waste the anointing so uh, policy leadership project coordination of ministry programs and finance any church structure will be tested in these five areas and how does people fail a, a, a church will fail if the program we do does not correspond to our vision there are programs that are serve its purpose and we have to scrape we have to scrape them uh, 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 people do ask me in the leadership teaching how do you know programs that has existed uh, their original plan because it will be it will put us on a mechanical level but there is no result we just want to do the meeting for doing sake but nothing forthcoming from the meeting souls are not one souls are not edified souls are not and it gobs a lot of money so in the place of vision in the local structure of a church you will know that this program has expired not because of anything it has served the purpose so vision tells you a program does not correspond to our vision because the church will have to grow up and which area does church grow up the church also has intelligent power a local church has intelligent power things we teach them is no longer practical to their daily lives so we have to find something that is practicable that is relevant and also that can also help the local structure of that church if things we do takes money from members and it doesn't help them to you know multiply money then it's not going to be a strong program hallelujah it takes money from the church and it does not bring money back into the church hallelujah i don't know maybe somebody's hearing me all right so anointing deals with people finances deals with project anointing deals with people your finance is not dealing with people is dealing with project if god calls you as a church how do we measure the growth of the church because one of the way we say we measure the growth of the church is by what is by the numbers number is there but that's not the first thing that measures the growth of the church the first thing that measures the growth of the church is stability somebody says stability the bible says nobody there joined themselves with the apostle again <laughs> they became stable that growth that was coming into the church in the early stage was becoming a serious problem and after incidents has happened after ananias and Sapphira died they didn't join them again so the church became stable the church has to go through stability not just multiplicity that has no impact this is where numbers it doesn't equal impact in ministry so how do you know a local church is growing we have a stable membership and then two we have a strong leadership structure when we say a strong leadership structure uh, now your absence becomes a point of reference to identify gifted people in the church it is expedient for me to go if i don't go the comfort i will know what so a, a pastor is not afraid when he leaves why because that is going to create an opportunity for the church to find their giftings and talents so how do you understand how do you measure the growth of a local church in the absence of their pastor <laughs> that's how to measure it hallelujah hallelujah and then the third thing is that souls are being won to christ souls are being won to christ people are coming to salvation and then souls are being edified this is what we call soul it will go through different refining process an evangelist will win a soul a prophet will steer a soul a teacher will teach a soul an apostle will govern a soul hallelujah do we understand one soul needs fivefold ministry to perfect the operations of that soul so this is one of the way we're going to see it and also people are willing the finances of that church will explode because people are told to give hallelujah it will not become difficult for us to do program because people are willing to leave the money at the apostles feet hallelujah actually the new testament church is both prophetic and apostolic 
the new testament church is prophetic because as they hear from god they speak the new testament church is apostolic because they have to take church out of its environment and go to places so apostles are the feet of jesus prophet is the eyes of jesus teacher is the mouth of jesus and then the pastor is the heart of jesus why do we do that an apostle will take gospel beyond its present location and drive it to many places but a prophet will hear from god and he will speak to people so the new testament church is both prophetic and apostolic in operations hallelujah i will also say this because of time we will also know that the church structure which is based on policy leadership finances and administration project and program between project and program which come first is program the program will lead us into a certain project project is the physical side of our exploits amen why program keeps running to attain the place of project so we will not abandon programs because we are doing projects that simply means the church is not balanced the program keeps running and then the benefit of the program is going into the project the project is what people see that makes them believe you are a man of god the program is what your own members see that keeps them running the vision is what keeps you you running hallelujah but the program is what keeps them running why the project is what keeps everybody what running do we understand what i'm saying right now hallelujah if you understand say it louder amen yeah. so some churches will be evangelical in nature why some will be pentecostal the evangelical are the soul winners the pentecostal are the one demonstrating the holy spirit and raising leaders and then a wise young ministers will combine both evangelical and pentecostal together to sustain his ministry hallelujah taking leadership serious <laughs> developing leadership is very important in fact in the next 10 15 years now employing pastors out of the local church will become completely forbidden that is those that you have never trained can never be a pastor under you the level and the rate of rebellion of people you don't personally train is overwhelming now in consequences the reason is very simple somebody you employ to become a pastor has one million perspective different from your vision and you will have to choose either your greatness is big and then you reduce it to fitting a pastor or you bring a small pastor and bring him to your greatness so until they are trained they are very dangerous a gifted man that is not trained is a dangerous man he will affect your work why because he doesn't possess your spirit he doesn't possess your spirit so that is going to be a need for developing strategic leader there are two types of leader we are going to develop we are going to develop leaders in the management level some is a management level they are decision making leaders we call them strategic leaders these are the one who sees because ability to foresee a problem before it becomes emergency is strategic leadership people have to see a problem before it becomes emergency in the place of emergency they won't be able to pick it so strategic leader sees problem ahead and then they tackle it before it comes into existence then we have what we call um management leadership hallelujah in the church now let me leave that and move to the doctrine first because we are talking about the local church structure and doctrine there are three major type of doctrine that are needed in the church one is what i call doctrinal knowledge what do we call it that is general knowledge a doctrine is not subject to change jesus is coming very soon how many of you agree there is no personal revelation that can alter that all right so the first type of knowledge is what we call doctrinal knowledge you can't get it anywhere except you study or you listen sit down for people to do what to teach. for the fact you are a pastor does not mean you don't need to sit down i know the numbers of hours i sit down daily and listen to teachers so for doctrinal knowledge it's not by prayer it's not by fasting 
is by study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The second level of knowledge you need is revelation. When we talk about revelation and knowledge, it is the working knowledge of truth. It is progressive in nature. And it is more or less, is extracted from the Bible. The interpretation of what you read from the Bible is revelation. And that revelation is dynamic in operation. It is not general as doctrinal knowledge, but is dynamic. So, uh, apostle can preach on giving. Daddy can preach on giving. Uh, Daddy can preach on giving. When three of them preach on giving, their perspective on giving is a function of their revelation. Now, a function of your revelation, it is the level of the interaction you have with the Holy Spirit and the light that breaks out in your spirit. So, we have different levels of intensity of light as regards the subject. And therefore, each of us will be exposed to the intensity of light we carry to be able to handle that subject very well. So, why doctrinal knowledge cannot change? Revelation can be altered because it's progressive in nature. The third one is experiential knowledge. The one you receive through encounters. This is why people have turned encounters to doctrine. God said I should use a stick of a bull. They brought a mad woman to my church one, one time, gave birth to a baby, and then ran mad. And then they brought her from, from a kiln. I thought it was a small issue. So when they came, the madness has increased. And so, on, so I became afraid. I said, what will I do now? I wanted to lay hands upon her. The Holy Spirit said, don't lay hands upon her. Take a bucket of water, pour it on her head seven times. I did that. She fell down, slept, woke up, and then she became normal forever. That was experiential knowledge. It wasn't doctrinal. It wasn't revelational. It was an experiential knowledge. It is a knowledge you need at that moment that can bring solution and then you forget it just as Samson forgot about the jawbone of what? Of an ass. When he used the jawbone of an ass to kill a thousand Philistines, what did he do with it? He threw it away. Some of us, we will build edifice around it. And you know one thing about God? One thing I love about God. Once... God is no more in that thing. Because what God said yesterday can persecute what he's saying today. If you don't upgrade, you'll be a man of God. And God doesn't have emotion. It's a spirit. It can take you 15 years to learn one thing. He has that patience because spirit has patience. So we must understand that to function effectively in a local church, we need a doctrinal knowledge, which I suggest to people that let your Bible study where they be a doctrinal knowledge. Why let your Sunday be a revelation and knowledge? And then once in a while, have an encounter five hours before the Lord. And let people see angels. If there is an angel there, and if there is no angel, let them see something. We must provide this three-dimensional knowledge because our spirit needs them. That's what happens in a church where they are doctrinally sound, but there is no revelation. It's burning. In fact, the type of knowledge that is most burning out of the three is doctrinal. Nobody wants to hear. We had it last year. You don't need to change anything from the doctrine. And all but if you are teaching on giving every day, something keeps changing in your teaching. The function that through which that thing changes is what we call what? That is what keeps people sustained in the church. And you can't get it without prayer and the study of the word of God. And then you must also understand that God must give you a teacher who will enlighten you in a subject. Because we are not grace in the same level. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, somebody's not. Hallelujah. Let, let, me, let, me, let me round up with this because I don't. I don't are you blessed? Yeah. All right. If you are blessed, say it louder. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Now, very important. Let me say this. Um, our ministry. All ministry comes from God. But all our ministry will not function in the same level. The issue of church doctrine is very important. And it's a major concern. I want to strike an example to you. Have you seen somebody who preaches on momentary revelation? Okay, I didn't plan for this teaching. He ministers. Second Sunday, I didn't plan for this teaching. He ministers. 
third Sunday. I didn't plan for this teaching a minute. If he keeps ministering that way, a time is going to come when there won't be a doctrinal defense in that church. So that when some of their members go out and they are telling them what's the difference between rapture and the second coming of Christ, they say they have never had that. But what they are hearing keeps them leaf, but it doesn't make them highly productive. So we are in the end time where people will not enjoy sound doctrine for marriage, for finance, for leadership. In fact, I will suggest to you, take it one after the other and develop strategic teaching in series. We have to go back to series. That's how we were taught in deeper life, when I was in deeper life. We were taught series. You are teaching on giving. If you don't consume all dimensions of knowledge in giving, you will throw your members into trouble. While you are teaching on giving, you will teach on giving as a means of prosperity impulsive giving giving as an emotional way of bribing pastors we have to teach all dimensions of giving because people wouldn't understand the dynamic of the giving in operation what about prayer do you know too much prayer is also a sign of unbelief you don't believe you don't understand how many of you know that it is good to pray but there comes that a prayer becomes an act of unbelief because it is done in repetition after God said it is done. Then fasting becomes, you have an ulcer. ulcer. Fasting doesn't care ulcer. It wasn't it. So why do we have a sound teaching in the church? For Jesus himself, that is the measure of the growth of the church. But in the world, it may not be the measure of growth. The church must be sound. From the least to the great, they must have the understanding, have the perspective of what the Lord is doing in it. And I have said it over and over, there may not be need for a noise and the Holy Ghost is moving. I define revival as the accurate response of believers to the move of God. Revival is about the response of believers. <laughs> revival is what? Now, can you say that? Revival is the accurate response of believers to the move of God. It therefore means when revival enters into v, 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 here right now, you will be kneeling down crying to God. You will be standing up. You will be frustrated. You will be prostrating. Another person see that. Another person is crying. Another person must say, Lord. Another person say, Lord, forgive me. We will not do the same thing. Everybody will have the revelation of how to respond to that move. When everybody responds to the move of God without being taught, that's revival. Because they say they will know me from the least to what? To the great. First John chapter 2 said, the anointing in you will subject you to teaching. You don't need anybody to teach you. So what the Holy Ghost is doing in that, it begins to teach us how to respond to him. And when we are open to that dimension, revival has happened, we wouldn't need to visit somebody before it comes to church. This is where we are going back. And we go back. Oh my God, I say we will go back. So there could be a time in our church that we give ourselves to the ministry. There was a time in my life, I prayed for one year, I fasted for one year. I keep asking the Holy Spirit, I say, how did I fast for one year? As if you ask me to fast for one year now, can I do it? I say it's not possible. Why? Ministry has increased in activity. I can show you seven things ministry contain. One is instruction. Someone say instruction. At the level where instruction dies, your ministry dies. Even though activity continues. Ministry activities is like you light a candle during the day. Will it command your attention? You are burning the candle. So the power of ministry force is instruction. Where instruction stop, your ministry stop. Even though activity continues. That's the first aspect. Two. The second aspect of ministry is the vision. Because we will all be judged based on the capacity of vision we are given. <laughs> so even if you see somebody 20,000 capacity, it's still a failure before God. Because in the capacity of God is 1 million. But because we have a wrong way of rating ourselves, it has affected our pursuit in God. 
So, what is the second one now? Can we say it one now? Vision. Three is prayer. The level of the prayer of the man of God and the level of the prayer of the members is the third level because ministry is continuous prayer. 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 Church must not stop. Activities of prayer must continue in different departments. Choir on Monday. Prayer warrior on Tuesday. On Wednesday, the usher. Just let them have ten, one hour prayer. Prayer must be on because the glory of God is the temperature of God. When temperature rises, when a child has temperature more than 39 degrees, it throws that child into conversion. So when the glory of God begins to rise in our meeting, it is the temperature of God that commands his attention. God can be in a meeting in different intensity. So what increases the intensity of God in a meeting is prayer. We have to pray until the temperature of God rises. The ordinary Bible study blind can see. And we must not forget that God wants supernatural to happen in our ministry. And it must happen. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ there will be supernatural release. Amen. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I'm praying, I'm praying in connection with our spiritual father in your ministry there will be supernatural manifestation. Amen. So much as supernatural manifestation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What does ministry contain? Activities. <laughs> Whether we like it or not, there will be activities in ministry. There will be activities. And those activities will be according to our calling. You see, one thing I love, Apostle Achudeme, is that daddy understands his calling. There are people, if they don't do VG every, every week, they will think they are backslidden as a pastor. And honestly speaking, you, you might have backslidden. But there are people that if they stand ministering to people in all night, it will redundant their anointing. Do you know the reason? Not because they are not. That's why in the area where we are not called, we become vulnerable. You become vulnerable. Number one, you struggle. Number two, you, have, you fall into sickness. Number three, you have bad dreams. Because if you are doing something that God doesn't compensate, he has a way of telling you it's not from me. Hallelujah. Finally, brothers. Hallelujah. Number what? All right. What have I mentioned? Activities. Two. Three. Four. Five. That's faces. Someone say faces. All faces of your ministry will not happen in one season. If you like, pray from now till forever. All seasons of ministry will not happen in one season. So understand that the ministry God has called you into has seasons. You must know that from the onset. If your friend season comes, celebrate him. If you are envious of someone, God will shut your door. There are some doors that it is God who shut them. Why? Because you are not celebrating what I am doing in the life of other person. And I think this temptation is going to be very constant in ministry. Ah, whether we like it or not. That is the mortal aspect of a man. You can't use somebody's testimony as a prayer point. It shows you have no purpose. I am telling you. That's why there are some things we didn't see in the New Testament as a pattern of the Pauline epistle. Why? Because Paul, on, there was a time in the ministry of Paul there was no miracle happening. The only thing happening was the epistle. Because Paul moved from miracles into structure. That's the, the, what the church is enjoying now is not the miracle done by the apostle Paul. It is the structure established by apostle Paul that we are enjoying. I can't enjoy supernatural dimension more than the time my knees are met under, your, under the power of God. So after it, people go back to where there are structures because they are men of status. And status need a structure to accommodate it. Hello? You can't keep harassing a colonel in the church just because he's your spiritual son. Jesus and Colinius talk. Colinius said, I'm a man under authority. I tell them to go. I tell them to call. If you want to heal my servant, speak the word only. 
So Jesus spoke in the understanding of what Colinius know. That is a church or that is a leadership structure. He didn't speak outside the structure that Colinius understand. He could have used different dimension. He stayed within that structural line to minister to Colinius. So riffraff people cannot accommodate wealthy people in a church. They won't stay. Why? There is no structure that accommodates them. The kingdom of God is already narrow. Don't make it narrower. Ah, you, do, ah, you don't know. Narrow is worth. That leads to what? But now, those who are going through the narrow way enter your church. You now make it narrow. Don't do this, 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 don't do this. They, they have escaped hell. They are now going through denominational hellfire. And you are praying for growth. It doesn't happen that way. So your personality will reflect in your leadership. What, that's the sixth one. Ministry is your personality. You cannot minister outside your personality. <laughs> so what we work upon is our personality. If you are a man full of angry, you are angry at keyboards, you are angry at drama, <laughs> you, people will leave your church. There are options people have now. We are in the world, we are in this realm that people are not ready to listen to sound doctrine. Now, if you don't apply wisdom to the teaching you have, people walk away. Ministry is personality. The personality of Jonah. Jonah. How many of you know that when I did a research and the study of Jonah, it will take Jonah two weeks to go to Nineveh by boat. But by fish, it took him how many days? Mode of transportation also differs in ministry. Some of us go through primitive. We go through longer process that result to frustration. By the time God involved fish, the fish dived underwater, navigated everything, and took Jonah to the dragon. That is, God chose a means of taking Jonah to the destination. Oh my goodness, somebody say, Lord, chose, choose a means of taking me to my destination. And I will agree with it. Can you say one more? I will agree with it. Say after me, whether you like it or not, our personality is our mode of transportation. In the ministry work. You don't trust anybody. Now you only go remain. Hallelujah. If you don't know how to settle dispute between your members, they will all abandon you. This is why leadership structure is very important in a church. Because what we celebrate in, 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 in Nigeria is the Holy Ghost move. That's why you see crowd attached to power. You see members attached to structure. Can you repeat what I say? Uh -huh. Can you say it one more time? So evangelist is the owner of crowd. They are the owner of what? Muslim will be born again. But you will find Muslim will be walking from the witcher. Why born again that is on which I is not rising up? Why? Because the revelation of God to a born again is different from a sinner. The only way God can relate to a sinner is God of miracle. But to a believer is God of order. God of what? So order means accurate arrangement of things. Without structure, we keep having crowd that doesn't benefit the church. They will line up for counseling, line up for money. And then when you have too much people coming for counseling in your ministry, it means that church has no structure. Some of the problem that we will face, solve is what they are, we are anointed for. When the anointing comes, the distribution of the anointing begins to solve problems. And then the problem left unsolved, most of the time, are the problem that has to do with a personal life. It, there is a difference between a need and a miracle. <laughs> a miracle can happen, but it doesn't meet your need. 
your need is the personality of your life that needed the fulfillment of purpose that somebody gives you one million naira it won't solve your purpose problem it can bail you out only the teaching of christ god's word can meet a need for fulfillment of destiny so therefore we must have a vision that must develop into program and then the program must be able to answer to the need of purpose then people respond back and then they do something about our project it is very very important and then no greatness function in isolation isolation produces desolation if you see anybody who claims greatness and is walking alone then he's being deceived you will sit down that subject that you can't teach very well go and learn it go to youtube god has given you internet teacher and then teachers in in the body of christ sit down and learn scripture <laughs> sit down and learn scripture. reverend godila said something powerful that will not lead me now <laughs> when it was ministry at that time you have a is my time up up let me stop let me stop hallelujah how many minutes five minutes okay let me let me, let me use that five minute well uh, hallelujah let me use that five minute well praise the lord praise the lord praise the lord all right um, um holy spirit help me i have a lot of things here but i will not i will i won't i just want to mention something that uh, have I mentioned that the ministry will go through vision, faces, project, and program? Yes. And then your prayer life, your prayer life will focus on this area. Your prayer life will focus. Because many people's prayer life is just focusing on Father, grow us, grow us, grow us. God doesn't grow people like that. If you really want a growth in the church, your prayer life will focus on father send me people i can train to become leaders what do i say don't say god send me leaders it's a wrong prayer send me people that can be teachable to become leaders two lord send us blessings that can help us do this project your prayer must include project otherwise you'll be doing spiritual ministry without project and it's very frustrating there, there is a visible aspect of ministry your prayer must these these are daily prayers lord we want to do this send us money number three open my eyes to programs that can result to our church growth Open my eyes to what? That can work. Because not all program result to church growth. Number four, that the Lord should send favor into whatever you are doing. God will bring favor. The miracle of money is access, favor. And then God blesses your efforts. 